Christ Church presents conversations about care, concerns, and connections, a roundtable discussion to acknowledge your concerns and offer a way forward. With Christ Church staff members Dr. Kathy Baker and Reverend Debbie Stokes, counselors Pam Johnson and Dr. Amy Perkins. Join us as they discuss the ongoing fear, worry, and anxiety affecting many in our community. Christ Church presents Care, Concerns, and Connections. We invite you to learn ways to cope and connect in the midst of concern. Hello, my name is Kathy Baker and I'm the Director of Education at Christ Church. Thank you for joining us today for a roundtable discussion all about the ongoing effects of COVID-19 in our community and in our church specifically. We're still feeling the effects of sheltering and quarantining in place and all of the social and economic fallout that has resulted from that. Our panelists today are all members of Christ Church and I'd like to introduce each of them to you. First of all, we have Pam Johnson, who is a licensed clinical social worker and we have Dr. Amy Perkins, a licensed psychologist, and then Reverend Debbie Stokes, who is the Minister of Congregational Care here at Christ Church. And Debbie, would you open us with a word of prayer? Yes, let us pray together. Loving and gracious God, thank you for this opportunity to have this conversation about our cares, our concerns, and connections as we continue to endure this pandemic and all the stresses which accompany it. Lead us and guide us today in new ways of how to cope and persevere through it all. In full assurance, O oh Lord, that you are with us each and every step of the way, and most of all, you love us all. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, Debbie. In a tracking poll that was conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation, 53% of the, those adults who took that survey reported that there had been a mental decline that uh, they were experiencing, some, a lot of negativity, and a lot of it was due to worry and stress over the coronavirus. Now, this number was significantly more than that 32% that was reported in March. Many adults reported that they were having specific negative impacts on their sleep habits, their mental well-being, their mental health, their eating practices, and they were in, uh, included having more consumption of alcohol and substance, other substances, and worsening chronic conditions due to worry and stress over the coronavirus. And so as this continues, we're seeing that the effect is, uh, uh, we're seeing a greater effect on isolation and loneliness. So we wanted to have this panel to address some of those issues. So panelists, let's talk for a moment about how we came to the decision that we wanted to do something together to address these issues. And, and I'll share with you what my perspective was uh, from the beginning. In dealing with a lot of families here at Christ Church, I was hearing from parents who were really struggling with the effects that this was having on their children. Um, we thought that maybe things would get better when they went back to school. And remember, they were hoping, just go to school. But then they went back to school, and now I hear from parents that, for the most part, things are not better. There's still a lot of uncertainty at school. And then our college students are really struggling with the effects of the pandemic as they are uh, moving away from home or having been sent back home. I'm also hearing from those who are widows and widowers and singles who are dealing with increased isolation and loneliness. And then there are those who've had family members in the hospital or they've had uh, them in uh, adult living centers, and they feel as if their loved ones do not have an advocate. So I am so concerned about all demographics of those in our church family. And I know others have uh, witnessed and heard some uh, other things. Debbie, what have your observations been? You know, as I've tried to do some <coughs> deep listening among our congregation, and even when I'm in the grocery store, um, I hear many emotions, uh, the emotion of fear, of 
catching the disease, the emotion of fear of loss of life, the emotion of fear of um, losing a job or financial difficulties, the stress that is surrounding all the, mm-hmm. the changes that are going on, um, that I'm also hearing just deep grief because of what's happening in the world. And also some people have lost loved ones and they haven't been able to have closure with funeral services or maybe it was a small service, but not all the family could attend. Um, There's grief in this particular community. I've always been conscious of from the loss of the homes in the tornado and just the community surrounding it as we drive through the neighborhoods and see the trees still damaged and homes damaged. That's a new dose of grief every time we drive that direction. And I also feel like there's a collective mourning, if you will, of, of the loss of normalcy, a collective mourning of the loss of um, the way things used to be, um, a mourning of our divided cultures around us and the, the strife and the conflict that's around us. And so everything has changed. And I try to get in touch with what maybe that feels like on the inside. And I think it ranges from a a feeling of homesickness, maybe like the first two nights at camp in the summertime, that feeling of, I just want to go home again to something that feels normal. And a sense of being on a boat that's out in the ocean, that the waves are just uh, rocking the entire boat, the passengers from side to side, and and everybody's lost control. And so uh, how do we get control in that? And so I'm so thankful for you all being here to help us navigate those rough waters. Well, thank you for bringing up the additional layer of complications through the pandemic the tornado that struck our area and then the violence that we're seeing in the streets and i love that you said we want to go home i love that thank you thank you Mm -hmm. Uh, pam what have been your observations well certainly i've seen grief i've seen anxiety i've seen depression um and and um understandably so there is this this virus um after the tornado the um the uh deep divides that seem to, to be between <clears throat> between many of us at, at, at this time, whether it be political or racial, it, it's heartbreaking. Um, th- there is still remains about the virus and, and perhaps even the, the tornado, the results of that, there's an inescapability. You, you can't get away from this thing. <laughs> and, and there is an uncertainty that still remains. Where is it going to go? When is it going to stop? When are we going to get hold of, of this thing? And also, it's just so pervasive into our everyday life. We, we have to think before we leave the house, do I have my mask? Do I have my hand sanitizer? How close am I standing to this person in line, uh, it, you know, in line in front of me? Or how close is that person behind me standing to, to me? And so it just pervades every, just about every aspect of our life, as, as you all have already so well put it. But, but I would want to make a point. I've also seen some things that are hugely encouraging to me. And I think we all have. Um, compassion. Neighbors, family, uh, reaching out to help people when the storm, after the tornado came, there were people coming out of the safety of their sheltering down and at risk to others, trying, trying to be careful, but still willing to get out there and, and help their neighbor, literally dig some of them out of their homes. Um, I have seen a, um, uh, a, a solidarity um, a, a, among people um, trying to be supportive. I have seen people, I've, I've heard people say, you know, with so much taken away or, or kind of washed away at one time, there's a, what's left behind is a, a simplicity that I find myself drawn to. Okay? So when things go back to normal, if, that, if that's going to happen, if that's in the cards, then there's some things I don't want to bring back that is quite as busy. In fact, I want to continue that process of simplicity because it allows us to, to think about what our priorities really are and is this where I'm spending, <clears throat> excuse me, spending my time or am I just chasing my tail with what everybody may want me to do or what I think I'm supposed to do, things that aren't of the utmost importance. So I've seen, um, again, a generosity, acts of service, and, and um, I, I heard someone say this, 
during 9-11, <clears throat> people ran into a burning building to help other people get out. During a tornado, people risk going into very unsafe structures to get people out. During this pandemic, people, um, frontline workers are out there doing, doing their job in a most heroic way. Um, during a time of crisis like, like we are, like we're in with a pandemic, you see people, you see the best of people. They don't think about, well, I'm not going to help this person out because they're Jewish or they're Muslim or they're Christian or they're atheist or they're black or they're white or they're uh, black or brown or, 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 or yellow. Um, it doesn't matter. We're, we're leading in those cases. Um, we're going to help a, a fellow human being. We're leading with our soul. And I know Debbie's going to talk more about our, our faith in, in, in this process. We're leading with our soul as opposed to our ego defenses that have us afraid of each other and seeing other people as the other simply because they may be different from us. So I'm, I'm really encouraged by those points of light in what has been a really chaotic and sometimes very dark time. Thank you for reminding mm -hmm. us of the good that has come from mm -hmm. the hard times that we've seen. I know mm -hmm. our church has been very responsive to need during this time. Yeah. We have mm -hmm. really rallied to help yeah. those who are really troubled and down. And mm -hmm. then for that reminder that good can come from evil, mm -hmm. it can come from dark mm -hmm. times, and God promises to work together all things for good to yes. those who love him and believe yes. him. And that's what we want to hold on to. There's the hope. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, Amy, you are a psychologist. You're also a mother of children mm -hmm. in school. And I know you have experienced and observed some things that you can share with us to shed some other light. Sure. I mean, I think sort of to go off what Pam was saying, some of the good things are being able to spend time with your family in a way that we couldn't before just because of distractions. Um, lots of distractions have been removed. I think that for lots of parents, what I've seen too is a struggle to, you know, we talked about sort of feeling insecure and the future is unknown, and then being asked to make decisions for your children um, without knowing, you know, do you send them to school? Do you keep them home? If you're keeping them home, are you homeschooling them? Are you sending them to virtual school? If you're sending them to school, you know, do you have enough masks for them? What is the school doing to make sure that they're safe? There's just a lot of, of things, and it's like, we need to know your decision today, but they're going to school two days a week this week, but five days a week next week, and who knows the week after that. Mm -hmm. So if you're a working parent, good luck. You know, so it's just mm -hmm. can be very overwhelming um, to parents being asked to make a lot of choices and to try and schedule a life around a situation that right now is just not schedulable. Um, and I think, you know, in our culture, we do live by schedules. Um, and so this can maybe we can see some good in learning to live a little more fluid and, and learning to be a little more flexible, but I do think it can be really overwhelming. Sometimes I think it's really hard for moms um, when other people are making different decisions than they are and feeling judged or maybe even just judging themselves internally. Am I making the best decision for my kids? Um, or maybe I feel, really, I would like to keep my kids home all the time, but I can't because I'm working and this is what I have to do and I don't really like this choice. And so I think a lot of it just has to do with all of the uncertainty and all of the decisions that we're being asked to make um, that are surrounded by uncertainty. And then on top of that, you know, you have to help your children manage those feelings as well. Your children are feeling... Um, overwhelmed or unsure. Um, I've heard of different uh, different friends whose kids have had to quarantine and so they were so excited about going back to school and then someone in their class tested positive and then the whole class has to quarantine yes. for 14 days but then their siblings get to go to school and so I think this is just <laughs> new and different and difficult and I think it's, it's okay to struggle. Um, I think that they're, I think it's great and let's acknowledge the good things that are coming out of this and let's acknowledge that this is also a struggle and, and it's okay to struggle. Um, it's okay not to be sure. It's okay to make a choice and maybe change your mind later. All of those things are okay. And I think in my work as a psychologist, what I'm seeing a lot with my clients, um, 
you mentioned the the stress levels increasing and over time you know we all I think <laughs> I think in March a lot of us thought like by the summer yeah. this will be over you know this will be fine um, and it and it isn't we're continuing to live um, in this new world and so I think lots of people are struggling with the continuation of stress, which you thought, okay, I'll just cope for this month and then it'll be fine. And then, okay, I'll just cope for these two months and then it'll be fine. And now it's kind of unknown how long we're all going to be in our homes and doing everything, you know, Zoom or whatever. And so I think that that can be hard. I, I think that a lot of people are struggling. Um, I've seen, a, I work with lots of clients who struggle with addictions and I think that's been a lot more difficult. People have been um, you know, when you're in your home and it doesn't seem like there's anything else to do, there's nowhere else to go, it's just easy to fall back into those old patterns. And so I, I think that what I love um, about what you said, Pam, is like seeing people be kind to one another because I think it's so needed right now. Everybody, I think we can probably say that everybody is struggling and there's just... A need to be kind, to not judge other parents' decisions, to reach out um, to people who you know may be isolated because they are single and living alone or widowed or, um, you know, any of those situations. I think it's just important that we acknowledge our own struggle, acknowledge other people's struggle, and as we're able to reach out to everybody. <laughs> I think we wanted to use this opening as an acknowledgement of what is going on and what we're observing and this period of uncertainty is what we're all experiencing and it is ongoing. And what we hope is that our viewers are finding themselves somewhere in what we have said because we want to be able to relate to those who are watching this. So uh, Debbie, as Minister of Congregational Care, you're very accustomed to showing love and compassion and empathy, and I know that our temptation um, as followers of Christ might be to say, well, you just need to have faith, and your faith will see you through. If you just believe enough, you'll see, uh, you'll see through this, and, and, and it will all turn out okay. Well, Debbie, what is your response to that? Well, thank you, Kathy. I was inspired recently by Wesley Memorial United Methodist Church in Cleveland, Tennessee's program that they had with uh, some counselors from their church as well. And the pastor there, Reverend Ramon Torres, spoke to exactly to that. And he referred to the verse that we know so well from Philippians 4, 6, that begins with saying, be anxious for nothing. And so often we think that um, because we have faith, we're not supposed to be anxious. But I love the words that he said, and I just want to um, give those, share those with you. He said, faith doesn't heal everything, but faith can give you the strength you need to seek the help you need, especially when it comes to mental health or emotional health issues. Faith is what moves us to seek that help because God wants you to be whole. And so I really appreciated that, that, that God desires that and God moves us through our faith to seek the help that we need. And oftentimes, that may be connecting with a dear family member or friends that we can trust, but also we can connect with our church staff and leaders and with counselors as well that God has given to us on this earth to help us cope through these difficult times. And, you know, as I think about it, um, the emotions we have, God has given those emotions to us, like fear. It's a healthy emotion. Um, but when fear is with us as long as it's been with us now through this pandemic, it can begin to have unhealthy ways in our lives. And God gives us the emotions of grief and tears. And tears are always a gift to release some of those emotions. But like fear, if grief stays with us too long or, um, or we're crying all day long every day, then it's time to reach out to those who can help, that God has given to us to help us through that. Because God wants us to live and live fully and to thrive so that we are enabled to help others. 
and to do that. And I've always appreciated counselors that have helped me through uh, the life and work of ministry. And also I, I have found that preventative counseling care is good too, not to wait until we're completely paralyzed and we can't move, uh, but to seek the help of others. And God rejoices in that. And God wants us to be whole. And I just appreciate that so much, uh, uh, Reverend Torres' words, um, that gives us permission to say, hey, this is a little overwhelming to me. Uh, who can help me? And I think that's so good. Thank you for those words about faith because our faith in God is, is this wonderful divine feeling that we have. It's a belief that through all things, we, God, we can conquer all things through him but it is also a call to action. And that's what we want to hear more about today from our counselors specifically. When uh, we need a call to action, we go to where we can get the help through therapists, through psychologists, through counseling. And so we're asking you to help us through that. Pam, what are some good coping techniques to help us through this fear and worry? Okay. And I thank you for what both of you said about the role of faith, okay? But thank you also what you've recognized is that um, I'm, I'm gonna quote Daniel Amen, a medical doctor in, yes. in this field who wrote a book a number of years ago, uh, The Brain, um, The Hardware of the Soul. And so I, I have people come to my office, they know I am a person of faith and they come wanting counseling from someone and they're so ashamed that they have let grief or anxiety or depression or anger take root in their life and, and really dictate the ways that it is gone. And, and, it, um, and, and unfortunately at times, their community of faith has reinforced that guilt and shame. Well, if you just had enough <laughs> or would just do this, somehow that will magically work. Well, we, we fail then to understand the brain really is the hardware of the soul. My soul is at home, with, with, is, is at peace. The Holy Spirit dwells within me. My soul is always okay. Almost like a hurricane when it's, you know, the sea is raging on the surface. I'm told if you drop down, maybe one, two feet down, those fish are going around, are going along as if nothing's happening up top because they're not being bothered at all by the raging wind. So when we do drop into that soul, ab absolutely our soul is fine. That's not where the problem is. And I, I want people to, to be able to understand that. Um, it, it is within the brain and then within the mind which is our consciousness, okay? And so um, I, I won't go into all that detail t today. We don't have that time. But let me, let me just say some of the things that I'm going to mention are all about resetting. And, and Amy, please chime in. <laughs> um, simply resetting the central nervous system, rebooting it, if you will, to help it come to a calmer place so that when we're in a clear and calm and more focused place, we're, we're able to access what our soul knows and, and access um, that we really are okay. Um, and so some of the things, that, and I, I find these because um, just because I'm a therapist doesn't mean that, and, and practice these things, doesn't mean that I don't have times where I wake up in the morning and it just feels sad to me or depression, a little bit of depression, a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of uh, frustration at how long is this going to go, okay? Um, we all, that's what I, we, we are all in, 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 the, in this together. I, I know it's a phrase we're hearing a lot of time. Um, well, I think one of the best things we can do is try to spend some time in nature. Nature reminds us that while all kinds of, there's all kinds of uncertainty in our, in our culture, in our world, in our economy, that nature's going about its business. You know, we've, we, we hit September. Before long, those trees are going to, the leaves are going to begin to fall. The winter will come. The spring will come. Totally unaffected by coronavirus or financial concerns or, or anything else that might be going on. That helps us take that deep drop into our consciousness where we realize where our soul dwells, it, it all is in God's hands, okay? And just remind, but we need reminding of that. I don't remember that first thing when I wake up. <laughs> I, I have to remind myself of that. Um, uh, meditation, prayer, mindfulness practice, 
mindfulness practice, Google it. <laughs> um, um, it is a huge help. I teach all my clients uh, uh, some form of mindfulness that works for them. Not one, not one form is going to work for everybody. But it's simply trying to engage the moment that we're in, not dwelling on the past moment, not worrying about the future moment, because neither of those places even exist anymore. But as I can stay, if I, as I can stay present in the moment, and it's about training your brain to more easily do that, then I can fully engage that moment and see what possibilities may lay there, lie, lie there, uh, where God is in that moment, what opportunities and, 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 like I said, possibilities, and what I have within me to meet that moment in as full a way possible. Um, I, I like singing and dancing. So one of the things I do in the morning is put on some fun music and dance with my dog while I'm, I'm getting his, his breakfast. He's playful in the morning. He's old, so he's only playful in the morning. So am I. So I'm about, we, we, get, we got our best energy when we first get up. So you'll find me uh, with uh, Alexa playing some of my favorite songs. It's usually those uh, 50s and 60s uh, rock and roll music that you can get going with. And Toby's just dancing all around. So, so play. We need to play. Um, certainly getting enough sleep. I find that, I, I say this about myself, I can handle a lot. I'm fairly flexible, resilient, and, and can come back from a lot. But let me miss my sleep. I bump my elbow and it's the end of the world. <laughs> so so I, I definitely need that. Um, moving, stretching, not staying in just, just any kind of movement. Healthy eating, just putting nutritious stuff in our body. I, I realized very quickly when I moved my practice home back in March, April, whenever that was, that, um, boy, if I kept this habit up that I did the first few days I was home, working for home, I might gain 25 pounds in this process. So having to be very conscious about what I was eating and how I was eating, drinking plenty of water, um, be aware of your needs and don't be hesitant about speaking up and asking for help to get your needs met. There's no shame in having needs. We all have needs. The most dangerous place a person, I think, can be emotionally is to be cut off from their emotions, cut off from their awareness of their needs, and um, not be processing those and asking for help. Um, breathe. <laughs> this, the, the exercise of taking a slower and a deeper breath um, and it would look something like this, drawing in a really deep breath to the count of three, holding it just a, a second, releasing it to, slowly through the mouth to a count of six. And what that, that type of rhythmic breathing does, it stimulates the vagal nerve. The vagal nerve runs from the brain stem literally to every organ, vital organ in our body. So it basically stimulates a relaxation response in, in the body. So at any given moment when you just feel like so many decisions I have to make with unknown you know, data out, out there, don't forget to breathe. When we're anxious and confronted with a lot, our breathing tends to become much more shallow and quick, which just adds to that anxious feeling in the body. So the deep breath. And it, Amy, you may have other things that you uh, are I mean, I think I can add to... Um the mindfulness piece, yes. I think, is, is very important. I think mm -hmm. just, it, it sounds like a really big undertaking. You know, it can sound like a really big undertaking. What does it mean to be mindful? What is all of this meditation and mindfulness? What does that mean? I think it can be very small, um, meaning what is, is, what is healthy and can be calming is to just be in the moment. And what that can be is just doing a grounding exercise. And by grounding, it's just mean you're grounding yourself in this moment. Because most of the time, in this moment, we're okay. There may be some stuff gonna happen in the future. There may be some stuff I'm worried about in the past. But right now, in this moment, I'm just sitting here with some women who care about me. And that, in and of itself, is comforting. There are some things that you can do to bring your mind into the present moment. If you just put both feet on the floor and you can just feel the floor, this current floor beneath your feet, um, that can be helpful. There's something called um, the five senses exercise where you just name five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, 
two things you can smell, one thing you can taste. And that will just bring your, your awareness to what's happening right now in this moment for you. And those are just two examples. There's so many examples out there of different grounding techniques. And I think Pam said, one thing is not gonna work for everybody. You're gonna have to probably try a couple of different things to find something that works for you. I also think as part of that is to create a practice of giving yourself space, right? So um, we all need space to just be. Uh, I call mine my tea time in the morning. I, I, um, there's lots going on in my house all the time, but I have my tea and I have a very specific chair and I sit in it and everybody knows mom's having her tea time right now. Um, and so that's my space. And I can use that space however, it, like I need to that day. Um, but it is my space. And I think that that space for me is a sacred, a sacred space. And I think it's just an important space for knowing what do I need today? What can I ask for today? What will help me today? It's also a way that I can say to myself without saying to myself, you're important, right? My needs are also important. Yes, I, I have a job and a spouse and children and coworkers and all sorts of other people who, who rely on me and who I need to you know, help and, and all of these things. And also my needs are important. Um, and it's okay for me, and I, and I really should. It's, it's healthy for me to give myself some space. Um, you know, all of these are such practical suggestions, aren't they? Yes. And what I noticed about everything you said is that nothing costs anything. Mm -hmm. There is nothing you have to go out and buy to fix this or to help this situation. So much of it is about your attitude and your approach to a situation. And it's something that I teach constantly uh, about how we think about things and getting control of our thoughts about a situation. And it's biblical. Our scripture tells us that we are to turn every thought captive to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so it begins there by changing the way we think about everything and putting into practice all those wonderful things from grounding to putting on the playful music and dancing mm -hmm. and switching the moment. Um, you know, sometimes people begin with mild fear and mild anxiety. And when those things don't occur that you've suggested, people begin to spiral and they start moving down toward depression. So Amy, what things can you tell us about the, when that begins to happen, what might one need to do? So I think that the first thing that can be really helpful is um, being self-reflective. I think it is important to know what you are feeling, to be able to actually name that emotion. So if you felt, let's say two weeks ago, you felt sadness and now you're feeling despair, what is the difference? Can you name the difference between this sadness and now I'm feeling despair, now I'm feeling hopelessness, now I'm feeling fear? Um, just being able to reflect and know yourself and, and know and just even to think, just to spend time thinking, what, what is happening for me in this moment? What is happening for me in my body um, in this moment? And recognizing this has changed, right? So two weeks ago I felt sad and now I feel despair. And I have noticed that that's changed. I think just being able to recognize that is sort of step one. Um, I, I also think it's really important to know that you're Emotional experience, one is normal. I think we've all said that, but uh, emotions happen to all of us, the good ones, the bad ones, the really bad ones, <laughs> they, they, they happen to all of us. Um, and so it's your body's way of telling you that you need to pay attention to something, right? Maybe you um, have been thinking lots of negative thoughts or maybe you have been working yourself ragged or maybe you haven't been sleeping well enough or any of these things that it might be telling you. And again, that's some self-reflection, um, self-knowledge, self-exploration. You can ask yourself too things about like, is there something specifically that's triggering me? So did something happen that I haven't acknowledged that has triggered me? What am I telling myself about this? Am I telling myself that 
okay, I'm, I was feeling sadness and now I'm feeling despair and this is never gonna get any better. Because the things that we tell ourselves have an impact on what we feel. Mm -hmm. And so if you're telling yourself that this is never gonna get any better, then that's gonna impact you and it's gonna impact you in a big way. Um, and so I think those things are important, just noticing, we call it self-talk, right? The things that you're telling yourself um, about what you're feeling. If you're saying, I feel so anxious and nobody else is feeling anxious and I'm the only one that's feeling anxious and I'm different than everyone else, that's gonna honestly most likely raise your anxiety even higher. Um, versus saying something to yourself more like, I'm feeling anxious right now, it's likely that other people are also feeling anxious. I'm struggling as a parent right now. It's likely that other people are also struggling. Um, and to be careful about what meaning you're giving to things. Um, so let's say that you're used to um, calling your, your mom every day and you call your mom one day and she doesn't answer. Well, if you begin to tell yourself, well, she's mad at me. My mom, she must be mad at me. She always answers my calls. She didn't answer this one time. And so now she's mad at me. That's gonna impact you emotionally instead of being able to tell yourself, okay, she's probably taking a shower. <laughs> or, or maybe she's you know, on the phone with someone else or any of the hundreds of things right, that she could be doing. Making meaning um, in a way that's healthy and accurate I think often when, our, when we get, I call it stuck in our emotions, we get stuck in our emotional experience, our thoughts begin to spiral in a way that becomes inaccurate. Um, we, we tend to, <laughs> I was laughing earlier about um, what you said, Pam, when you said that you were, if you were sleepy and you bumped your elbow, it would be a really big deal. And I think that can happen because we tell ourselves, oh my gosh, I've bumped my elbow. This is the 1700th thing I've done today that has been really hurtful to me. I'm just having the worst day that I've ever had in my entire life and this is never going to get any better. Those are the types of things that we, that we tend to tell ourselves in those moments. And you know, most likely that's not accurate. Most likely bumping your elbow is probably not the worst thing that's gonna happen to you. Probably not even the worst thing that's gonna happen to you that day, <laughs> you know? Um, and so just making sure that you can accurately reflect to yourself your own experience, that you can be aware of your emotional experience. And these things will help you acknowledge what your needs are. And then when you know what your needs are, that's when you can ask for help. I think that it is always helpful to reach out to a professional if needed. I, I loved what you said about getting, getting um, counseling before you need it, right? Right. I think that can be right. really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, so that you can learn some of these tools so that when the time comes, I, I will tell you it's, it's a lot easier to engage with a client who is sad than to engage with a client who is just really deep in their despair. Um, and so I think the earlier you can acknowledge that you're really struggling and the earlier you can reach out for help, the better. So important, recognizing those early signs. And then another big takeaway I'm hearing is the importance of our self-talk. What we tell ourselves is so important because we live out what we tell ourselves, don't we? It will show up. And uh, we are kidding ourselves if we think that we can continue to have unhealthy patterns of thinking and that it won't show up because it will. So we need to get a hold of those and recognize where we are. Well, one of the areas we've been really concerned about is the growing loneliness and isolation people are feeling. I've had this real burden for those who are shut in and just can't get out at all to go anywhere. And I'm now part of a group that goes out and does car parades to those who are shut in and we take balloons and we drive by and we wave and we blow the horn and we have posters and we just brighten their day a little bit uh, because they're isolated and lonely. What are other things uh, that we can do to help the loneliness uh, that people are feeling, especially to help them to feel connected those in our church or in our community that have disconnected? Um, so we have been talking a lot about like being able to say your own needs. I think we should all also give ourselves permission to ask other people what their needs are. Um, because I think lots of times, you know, we are right now in a way that we haven't been in, in the past. We're a little bit hindered in the way that we can connect. Our mm -hmm. typical ways of connecting aren't really 
available. Um, and so I think there are lots of ways that we can connect, connect, like Zoom or phone calls or even face-to-face, -face, but you have to ask the other person, how would you like to be connected? Do you want to do a Zoom call? Because I know that some people are just so tired, <laughs> so tired of seeing another face on a screen that that's not the way that they want to connect right now. They may want to connect face-to-face -face, and maybe you can say, maybe I don't feel comfortable with face-to-face -face right now, but I know that my friend over here, Pam, loves to meet with people face-to-face. Mm -hmm. -face. <laughs> and she'll be happy to meet with you face-to-face. -face. Um, and so I think it goes sort of both ways as the person who wants to reach out needs to feel comfortable asking someone, what do you need? How can I help you? Is it, would it be helpful if I came by with balloons? Would it be helpful if I came by and left, you know, a nothing but cake on your, that's how I would like yes. to be reached out. <laughs> um, what ways can I, can we connect? Um, and to acknowledge that that may change day to day. One day I might love a Zoom meeting and the next day I might be all Zoomed out. Um, and really just want you to call me on the phone. The next day I might like say like, yeah, let's drive around and you know, wave at people, that sounds great. And so I think it's all in flux, you know, our needs are in flux, they're not the same day to day, and it's okay to say your needs and it's okay to ask other people what their needs are. Um, I think too it's important to acknowledge all of the division right now that is happening in our society and in the US, political division, racial division, and I think it's important to recognize that you can connect with others even when you don't agree. Like, it's okay to connect even if you're not agreeing. Um, it doesn't really take agreement to make a connection. You can still reach out to another human being. We are all human beings. Um, we all, you know, want connection. We all do, and so I think you can do that without having to even talk right now about the politics. And, and sure, maybe you have a group of people who you do talk about that with, and that's totally fine, but it doesn't have to be a part of every single conversation. It doesn't have to be a part of the way you connect to other, other people, and just because you see a specific difference, you can connect anyway. Um, yeah. I'm hearing some things that you reminded us of the importance to take care of ourselves mm -hmm. and be aware of what others need, to ask ourselves questions and ask others questions about what they need. Well, we know the Bible um, encourages us to practice our own self-care. Mm -hmm. Jesus did that. Remember, he went away to a quiet place to pray. Remember, he told Martha, you're worried about too many things. And think about one thing, few things. And then uh, we know that he teaches us that we're to love others as we love ourselves. So Pam, help us sort through that struggle of loving other people and at the same time practicing self-care. Mm. Amy mentioned a word a few paragraphs back, practice, practice. And, and I think that any kind of emotional, spiritual healing, growth takes place in the context of practice, which is something, some, some things that I'm going to do. It's not that the power is in the practice. What the practice does is bring my attention back to a place where I am open to hearing what I need to hear for wholeness, for healing, for guidance, okay? So practice, and, and, and we, you also mentioned this, Amy, and I think it's so true, it will not look the same from one person to the next because we're all wired differently. We're in different places in our, in our walk, our daily walk, our faith walk, or our personal walk. But so I think we, um, first I would say it, under self-care, make a list, take some time, and make a list of your top five, six priorities. Well, it, 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 when your epitaph is written at some place, <laughs> okay, um, on an urn or on a, on, a, on, a, on a slab, what do you want it to say? How do you want to be remembered? How do you want your children or grandchildren to, to remember you? And then as, write down those things, and, and then make sure that your day, each day, bookend your day with uh, reciting to yourself what your priorities are. And make sure that you're spending your time as much as you can involved in what those priorities are. 
okay? Doing such kindness, we've talked about kindness, generosity, and, and that comes also in, in ways to reach out to the other. I, I read this, there were 23 different studies done, and, and in, these, in the people who were in these studies, 57%, I wanna read this to make sure I get it right, showed statist statistically significant positive psychological and biological changes associated with improved health, including lowering your blood pressure, reducing stress and anxiety, boosting the immune response, enhancing hormonal balance, and, pro and promoting positive mood states as they engaged in acts of kindness toward other people. Okay, recognizing the other is not my enemy. Just because someone thinks differently than me, that's fear. Fear comes from the deeper mind. It's part of the ego construct. It is not the soul. Okay, the soul is who we are, our essence. And so when I'm acting out of soul, or when my soul is driving, okay, I can't get rid of my ego. It's my defense mechanisms. It's like my immune system is for my body, but it needs to ride in the back seat like my grandchildren, they can't drive, okay? So when our soul is driving our decisions, okay? And in our practices, they bring us back, our practices help us come back to where we can focus on what is always there. You know, we have always lived in an uncertain world. There are always things that you go into the doctor feeling fine and you come out with a pretty scary diagnosis. You think your marriage is fine and your spouse come home, comes home and says something that helps you see that that's not, not the case. Or a child has an, an issue come up that is a very challenging issue, financial setbacks, you name it. It's just that right now so much is happening at one time, it's kind of in our face. But the truth is, we have always lived in uncertain times, okay? Um, and, and Jesus was quite clear about that in his teaching. So all the more reason that the safest place to stay is in the moment. It, it really is the only place we can be, because we can't be out of, <laughs> out of where we are right now. So, so staying, staying in, that, in, in that moment um, and just remembering to, to, when, you, when you find yourself wandering into the future or back in time, just kindly and gently with that inner witness, not the inner critic, the inner witness. Bring yourself back. Hey, wow, I see myself going all over here. Let me just bring myself back home to this moment because, as you said, Amy, most, most moments were okay. <laughs> um, Taking a break from the news um, and, and putting boundaries up with um, uh, just so much negativity, okay? If I'm, I, I have personally had to take a break from the news. At one time in my life, I could have been a political junkie, a news junkie all, all, all the time. And I really have to screen that out because if I'm going to show up in life, show up in the moment and, and make the most out of what and who might be in front of me, the opportunity I might have in front of me. I just, I can no longer be distracted by all the divisive stuff that I hear in the news on, on both sides, on, on both sides. So for me, I'll speak for myself personally, I've got to focus on, okay, God, what's in this moment? Because I know you're there. <laughs> I, I know something's going on and I know I can hear it and see it. You will show it to me as I focus my senses, all five of my senses, on, on, on hearing that, and then take that next right step, whatever is happening going on around me. D does that, that make sense? Absolutely, and okay. I, I thank you so much for reminding us to be present in the moment and count on what is true, what is real. Yes. And I think I would yeah. add to that, knowing who God is, God is always good. Yes. He can be nothing but good. Mm -hmm. um, he is not the one that causes evil. He, so we, if we know who God is and we can trust him, then we can trust him to see us through whatever we are facing. And I think it's important for us to look back at times in our lives where he has been there for us and seen us through and know that if we could trust him then, that we can trust him now. Uh, I'd like for us to look at our final question, which is going to project us into the future. Um, it's a question that many um, will have to deal with. Uh, our church for uh, um, Sundays is closed for no one can come and worship in our building. I, I hesitate to say our church is closed because we're 
<laughs> our staff is so busy and we're doing so many things in ministry, but we're not able to come to worship and a lot of people have become very comfortable in that. So I'm going to pose this question for us to grapple with. If church were to open for worship on Sunday very soon, what would you do? Would you go back in? What are your thoughts? Debbie, can you shed some light on that one? Well, thank you, Kathy, and thank you all for your contributions to the conversation. And I just want to echo and add that God cares for us, each, each person that will be listening to this, and to know that God loves you beyond our imagining. Um, and so this summer, we were able to meet in person again uh, for worship uh, for about three Sundays. And I got, I have to confess that the first Sunday I was a little bit anxious about it because there were so many things that would be different. Um, every other row of seats, um, empty and full. Um, we couldn't sing uh, all together. Uh, we had to keep the social distance. Everybody had on masks. And um, it was different. And I have to confess that uh, I love people and I was ready to shake hands and wanted to hug and, and greet, and it just felt a little bit more reserved, and I missed the way it was. Um, but I tell you, not being able to gather for worship or our small group times or Sunday school times or Wednesday night fellowship times, I have missed it so much. And God has made us such that we do want to connect with each other, and God has created us that as we gather together for worship, there's um, uh, that holy mystery in putting us all together that we are lifted up by God's spirit. It's not that we just bring ourselves to worship, but God meets us here and God replenishes our souls to go back into the world for a week of work and we are replenished by each other as well. So I'm missing it so much. But like you all have said, it slowed our schedules down somewhat that we've had more quiet time with God in those sweet devotional times mm -hmm. to hear God's voice say to us, I love you. I understand your frustration, your anger, your depression, your uncertainty, your stresses, but I'm here with you and I'm going to carry you through. And I think as we all come back to worship, we're going to be changed people. We're going to appreciate it more, be more grateful for it, and we're going to be, even if we're masked and everything that we have to do, we're just going to be so excited and replenished by God's Spirit. And something about our conversation today has made me think about that um, the Scriptures say the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. And I've probably left, there are nine. I've probably <laughs> left one out there. But I think this season is teaching us a different kind of patience, mm. not just patience in a short moment, but long-term patience for the season that it's gone through, almost entering a third season now from March. We're entering September in the fall season. And it's teaching us deep patience. It's teaching us those gifts of the Spirit that run real, real deep in our souls that will bear good fruit, just like you spoke of nature, a bulb in the earth, how does it know when it's time to burst forth uh, in a season? It's, it's in the dark in the earth, but it knows. God's, God's good creation uh, is in its seasons, and I believe in the midst of this, God is teaching us some really good things that will bear much good fruit in the time to come. So I look forward to gathering again. I think that was a mini sermon right mm -hmm. there, don't you? That was very beautifully said. I like that you said he will meet us here and replenish us so that he can send us out into, into the world. And I thank you for that reminder. I recall those three Sundays we did meet that you would not find a safer place to be. And I know that's the way it's going to happen when we return. Uh, we practice every precaution possible. And if you can go to the, the store, grocery store, or to the pharmacy or a doctor's office, 
um, then you can come to Christ Church and, and feel very safe and secure. And I hope when we open that our congregation will return to us here. Uh, we hope that you have found this very helpful and very comforting today. We'd like to do some kind of follow-up. I don't know if it will be in the form of a video or if we will do a Facebook Live session or what we might do. But if you have questions or comments that you would like for us to address, please email that to me. And you can email me at education at Christ Church Chat, and that's with two T's, Dot org, and I'll be happy to pass that on to our counselors or ministers, and we would love to follow up in some way. I want to close with one of my favorite scriptures that I think will provide some comfort for us. It is found in Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining us.